The town of Lund in southern Sweden isn't often the focus of global media attention. Extra police from all over the country have been brought in to provide protection for the papal visit. At Lund Cathedral, where a joint Lutheran-Catholic service will take place, altar boys and bishops have been busy rehearsing. The head of the World Lutheran Federation says the ceremony marks a major turning point in Christian relations. It's a historic reconciliation between both churches, Lutherans and Catholics. And it's very important because the Holy Spirit brought us to this step. Wars over religion once tore Northern Europe apart, but today Sweden and other majority Protestant countries are largely secular. Religion isn't a part of daily life for many Swedes. I was trying to explain who the Pope was, and I was saying, uh, do, you know, do you know who God is? No, nah, he doesn't know that. Do you know who the Pope is? No. And then I'm saying, like, do you know who Dragonite is, the Pokemon? He's like, yes, I know that. And pretty much would say that sums up uh, Sweden. We're not that religious. Centuries ago, Swedish Catholics who refused to embrace Lutheranism faced deportation or death. Today, the two churches are looking for ways they can work together more closely in the future. Now we call upon all Catholic and Lutheran parishes and communities to be bold and creative, to be joyful and hopeful in their commitment to continue the great journey ahead of us. His Holiness, Pope Francis, and the LWF President, Bishop Yunnan, will now sign the joint statement as an expression of the commitment of our two communions. Well, welcome to another segment of Christ and Culture. My name is Jeff Short. This is Mel McGinnis. And we're talking about the five solas of the Reformation in uh, honor of Reformation Day, uh, which was October 31st every year. Uh, it comes down to uh, at the end of October. And the reason it's at the end of October is I think that's the reason that that's when it was at when Luther nailed his... 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. Yeah, it was right around that time. I yeah. don't know if it was exactly October yeah. 31st. Yeah. But uh, now, what was Luther's big beef, and why did he nail his uh, theses to the uh, Wittenberg door? What was his What was his argument there? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I think it really boiled down to uh, justification. Uh, the Catholic Church's understanding of it from a perspective that strayed from Scripture mm -hmm. and his uh, grounding that doctrine in the Word of God set the Catholic Church off. His growing understanding yep. of it, uh, well the thing that set him off really uh, and got him pounding his his, his uh, proclamation on the door was the indulgences. Mm -hmm. um, there was a man named Tetzel yep. who was running around Germany uh, raising money for St. Peter's Basilica back in Rome. And the Pope knew he was out there and said, yeah, just go, you know, raise the money, whatever you can get. And Tetzel was saying exactly what you had said before, that uh, uh, you could pay to have the souls of your relatives and family members 
removed from purgatory. So you could actually shell out money to get souls out of purgatory because according to Roman Catholic theology, when you die, um, because you, you, you may be saved, you may be eventually bound for heaven, but you still have these sins that have clung to you and, and things, so you have to have something that purges you. And this process could take years, decades, mm -hmm. even centuries. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a long, complicated doctrine, totally unbiblical. There's right. nothing in the scriptures that talk about purgatory. There's nothing that the early church uh, has to say about purgatory. It's just something that developed. Mm -hmm. um, it is unbiblical. And when Luther saw this monk running around making money and playing on the vulnerability of ignorant peasant Germans with the hope that they could release their family members, deceased loved ones from purgatory by shelling out money, it really ticked him off. And I don't, I don't blame him for being ticked off. This was a blatant, mm -hmm. uh, greedy, corrupt mm -hmm. practice all under the eyes of the Roman pontiff and hierarchy and with, with their blessing. Yeah, and it was very manipulative too. Played uh, on their emotions, yes, psychological yes. manipulation. Yeah, I don't feel like it really spoke to their mind. Uh, what it really got into was the subjectivity in their heart and the people not having the word of God as we have it today. Yeah, so we take advantage, we yes. take it for granted. Yeah. They couldn't check it out. They couldn't be like the Berean church that when Paul spoke, they checked to see if it was in the scriptures to see if it really was so. Right. And because they didn't have that, they fell for it. Yep. And yep. Uh, it's yep. a yep. sad chapter in the history of the church, but fortunately somebody like Luther came around and spoke up and uh, not only spoke up, but st stood his ground. Yes, when he, he, said, Here he I was stand. bothered by it. It really got to him because he saw the exploitation, the corruption that was taking place. And he posted a notice for debate. He says, I will debate anyone mm -hmm. about this issue of indulgence and mm -hmm. some other things too. And, but the indulgence was the main thing. And this was in the time with finally in the world history, the printing press had come. So somebody, whether some of his students, some other professors at the Wittenberg, um, they printed these up and they passed them out. And they said, hey, this guy is challenging the authority of, of Rome on indulgences. And it became a big mm -hmm. scandal. And one thing led to another. Um, there was a debate that was eventually held and a series of debates, and Luther began to be pressed to recant and to um, give up what Rome called rebellion and heretical teachings. And as he began to explore further and further, he began to see that the corruption wasn't just indulgences. It went a lot mm -hmm. deeper. And so he began to challenge all kinds of things. And so finally it came to the head that he was excommunicated. Yeah, and I think in doing this, he, his intention was not to start another church. Right, it was, was never. Was not to start a separate uh, movement outside of the Catholic Church. He wanted to see the church reformed. He right. wanted to see the church purified. He wanted right. to work within the system in order to get rid of those false doctrines that were there. Like indulgence. Yep, yeah. But as it turned out, like you said. Well, and the reason why it was an irreformable situation was because the scripture alone was not the authority. Mm -hmm. So how do you reform a church whose authority is the church? Mm. How, it, it, you don't have any means by which to reform a church when the church holds the authority, final authority, mm -hmm. to interpret scripture. Now there was the hope, a long held hope, that there would be a council that could be called. Luther had called for a council, uh, Zwingli called for a council, uh, even the second generation, Calvin, 
who was just a young boy at the time of Luther, but then grew into a strong reformer, uh, he called for a council. Finally, what was it? 30, 40 years after the, 50 years? I can't remember the exact time, but decades after the initial controversy with Luther, the Roman Catholic Church held a council called the Council of Trent. And instead of bringing together the reformed segments of the church and sitting down like the Council of Nicaea and really getting into the theology and hashing out scripture and all the different issues, it was a basically a kangaroo court. It was a it was a sham council. Mm -hmm. They already knew what they were gonna say before they even mm -hmm. called it. They basically probably had all the documents written before they even called it. And they basically anathematized reformers uh, and said, no, we're not changing. And the only thing they changed were some of the clerical abuses of the time and stuff like that, but nothing major. Yeah, or to say it in the common vernacular of our day, that council was rigged. It was rigged. <laughs> the fix was in. And, and so today, 500 years later, uh, the Catholic Church still holds to the dogmas and the uh, decisions of Trent. Right. And if you go back and read what Trent said. Wow. I mean, it is it, really harsh. Oh. It basically blasts everybody that doesn't hold to everything the Roman Catholic Church has ever held to. And they blast them so bad they call them cursed. They're cursed. I mean, yeah, wow. anathema. You know, yeah. very strong language. Uh, they dug in their heels. They did not listen to what the reformers were saying. And, you know, here we are 500 years later. And now we have a pope who um, is going to Sweden and meeting with not even the faithful Lutherans. That's the thing that has bothered even the traditionalist Catholics today. The pope is not talking and dialoguing with the faithful Lutherans, the ones that really Luther would have found kindred with, the mm -hmm. Missouri Synod, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. They're the ones that actually take the the understanding of scripture seriously and the doctrine seriously. The World Lutheran Council is a liberal religious body. They don't even believe the scripture. They right. don't even believe most of the doctrines of the historic Christian faith. And the Pope is over there signing an accord with that body. Which makes you wonder where exactly is his mind? Well, what does that's, he really believe? Yeah. And so, so he's trying to bring the two together, but it's not based on the truth. Mm -hmm. It's based on just a touchy-feely ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So um, he's getting into trouble with everybody. Um, he's getting into trouble with uh, especially the, the, the traditionalist Catholics who are saying, hey, you know, why is he going over there and seemingly blessing Luther when Trent Ex basically anathematized mm -hmm. so um, so but let's get into our sola our last sola it's the um, sola soli deo gloria to God alone is the glory only to God is the glory now this one is probably the most least understood uh, solos uh, soli do Deo Gloria. What might do you think that the reformers were trying to say with this one? Well, I think when you look at solo gratia, sola fide, solo Christus, mm -hmm. sola scriptura, mm -hmm. uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, mm -hmm. revealed in scripture mm -hmm. uh, alone, the glory can only go to God alone. Mm -hmm. If it's all by grace, if it's through faith and by Christ mm -hmm. in his saving office, mm -hmm. there's no glory except to God's glory. Mm -hmm. Man has no part in this glory. 
So it seems God to be gets a logical. Yeah, it seems to be a logical pr progression. Yeah, it's the purpose for everything. Yep. Yep. I mean, the, what is the purpose for our existence? What is the purpose of the church? Yep. What is the purpose of salvation? It's for the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, his master plan. This is His creation, and His world is fallen, but it's for His glory. Yeah. Uh, and our and our lives are for the glory of God. And it it really makes it God centered. Yep. Instead of man centered. Yep. And and this is a message that today we really need to hear because. You know, we've got so many churches that are man-centered, wouldn't mm -hmm. you agree? Mm -hmm. It's just all about, yeah. you know, the, if you look at the, the the way they're structured and the sermons that are preached, yeah. it's just like, okay, we're going to tell you five tips on how to feel good, or we're going to, how to have a f successful financial future. It's, it's all about man and his petty little needs. Right, and the how to, how to. It go. It strays from the gospel. How to have your best life now? It really uh, just pertains it's, it's, to it's, it's, this it's, it's life. Sad. And it's such a contrast to like the first question I think in the Westminster Catechism. What is the chief aim of man? To glorify God. Glorify God. Enjoy Him forever. Yes. So for His a, glory. Yeah. For a catechism like the Westminster. Yeah, not about us. Right. It's right. about Him. Right. It's about God. He's God. Right. We're not. You know. Yeah. It's, it's not about us. It's about God. And we find our meaning and purpose when we fit into his plan mm -hmm. and for his glory. Yeah. And, you know, if you look through all of these uh, solas, really, this is kind of like a prescription for what ails the modern church. Yes. You know, if I was thinking about this the other day. You know, what is just so hard with a pastor getting up in front of his congregation on Sunday morning, opening a text explaining what mm -hmm. God has said, on bringing out the meaning of it, and then applying it. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. It's so simple. You don't have to be a philosopher. You don't have to be a scientist. You can just simply open up the scripture because that's what God is trying to say to people today, what his word is saying. Mm -hmm. So, But that's so hard for churches. It's so hard for pastors to just get up there and, 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 and give people the word. They have to give all of this fancy stuff they got to be you know entertainers and they got to do a little song and dance and they got to do a little philosophy and politics and science and and throw everything in there that's like you do you really believe in sola scriptura or not yeah it seems like a lot of churches don't believe in sola scriptura yeah yeah unfortunately uh you see that um <clears throat> uh compromise with the world's methods in order to try to get the message across. So in a way, we're like the Catholic Church back when, when we uh, confuse mm -hmm. the message with trends and topics of this world. And yeah, they need to be addressed certain topics as scripture oh, yeah. addresses oh, yeah. them. Yes. But to lose the message of the gospel is a tragic thing. And I always like hearing what Rod Rosenblatt uh, he has his doctorate, I think, in Lutheran theology. He's a pr professor, retired professor now, said, mm -hmm. what do you want when you go to church? He just says, all I want to hear is that the death of Christ is sufficient for me. He just wants that gospel message for a yeah. professor like him who is so well-schooled, intelligent, who can go into the depths of Scripture, but all he wants to hear on Sunday mm -hmm. is I want to hear that the death of Christ is enough for me. Right, and that sola gratia, yep. solus Christus, sola fide, sola scriptura. I think sola scriptura is probably um, the one that, boy, if churches could implement sola scriptura, um, mm -hmm. there would be so many divisions healed. Mm -hmm. You just go back to the Bible and, yep. you, and, and you read it in an honest and plain yep. way to say, look, let's just walk through this text. Let's just yes. walk through this section. Very good. What does it say? Right. This is what we believe. Yeah. And, and cling to that. I mean, but it's not just churches. It's personal. You know, you go to the Bible. Um, those are things, the promises of God in there are things we can cling to. Mm -hmm. That is the solid foundation for life. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's just, you know, you look at the political turmoil in our country right now, and I thought about this the other day. Well, whoever is president, after all is said and done, um, we're still going to read from the Bible. We're still going to trust in the Word. We're still going to carry out the mission that Christ gives us. It doesn't matter if a Republican or a Democrat yep. or an Independent right. is president. Right. Uh, we still have our calling from God. We still have the Great Commission. Yep. We still have the infallible Word of God. Um, we're good to go. Now, the consequences for us preaching the Word of God may be different. Mm -hmm. I mean, they may throw us in jail under a certain administration. Mm -hmm. They may fine us like they do in Canada. If you preach a certain Christian biblical morality, you get fined, you get jailed. But the consequences will be different under different administrations, but the mission is the same, right? Right. right. Um, it doesn't change. No, no. Uh, we may be experiencing a time like they did way back in Europe when the field preachers went out to make the word of God known. And there were uh, targets on their backs. Yes. Uh, there were persecutions of them who preached the unadulterated word of God to the masses. Yeah. And we just need to be ready and prepared for that. Will it happen overnight? I doubt it. Are we going in that direction? Yes, yes gradually. Yes, we are. But like you say, our message does not change. It stays the same. God still reigns. God still rules. Uh, we have a sure hope that serves mm -hmm. as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Yes. And uh, we can make that hope known when there is much religious liberty and make it known when we feel religious liberty is being strangled. Mm -hmm. And uh, that communicates to people, there's something transcendent here. Yeah. And the, these things, these, these five solas, though, um, it makes you really feel good about being identified with the Reformation. Yes. I think we need to see more people standing up and saying, no, I'm not ashamed of being identified with those reformers. Yes, right. Uh, they discovered what we need today. Would you rather be standing with Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and those who point us back to scripture today, or would you rather be standing with people who have to look to this crazy guy called Pope Francis Mm -hmm. talking in the back of an airplane off the top of his head, spouting out heresy, and that even the traditionalist Catholics recognize as heresy, going flying over to Sweden and signing an, a, a sort of a sham accord with the Lutherans, with a liberal body that they don't even believe the scripture anyway. I mean, is that a solid foundation for one's life? No, but sola scriptura, Sola fide, sola gratia, solus Christos, soli Deo Gloria. These are the things that really can point us in the right direction once again, right? Yeah, and isn't it interesting? As great as an intellectual and theological movement the Reformation was, mm -hmm. I mean, you had intellectual heavyweights that really dug down deep into the Word of God. Oh, yeah. A tremendous philosophy that came out of that, and yet you can simplify it. Yeah. You can make it so clear. Yeah. We are saved by grace alone. Yep. Through faith alone. Yep. On account of Christ alone. Right. Through yep. the preaching and teaching of the Word of God alone. Mm -hmm. uh, to the glory be to God alone. Oh, it's just, yeah. it's just, it just is exactly what the Bible says, and it just reminds us more and more, we've got to keep preaching the Word. We've got to keep bringing people back to the Word. We've got to make sure that when we get up in the pulpit, we are not giving people our own human opinions. I have to check that mm -hmm. myself. I'm sure you have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very tempting yeah. uh, in the political <laughs> year to, to really go off in a political direction from the pulpit, but I know ultimately that is not what's going to help right. people. I know that's not going to help our nation. Uh, we are strongest when we are grounded in Scripture yep. and speaking prophetically. Yes. Not when we are doing like what the false prophets did, basically telling people what they want to mm -hmm. hear. And 
we have to resist the urge to s concede our authority to the sola cultura. I know David Wells, the theologian from uh, As er, uh, Gordon Conwell. G Gordon, yeah. He said that he feels that modern evangelical, basically their authority is sola cultura. Yeah, the culture. interesting, yes. You just find out what the culture's doing, what's hip, cool, yeah. what's with it, you know. And you just get into that and ride that wave, you know, the popular wave until some other popular wave comes through. But my feeling is, and I think the reformers would say this, I know they would, you go back to scripture. Mm -hmm. Sola scriptura. That's the authority. We have to stand on scripture alone. And then when we do that, we'll find out all about the other things that God has for us. Yeah. No and compromise. I, I think what the Reformation did was that the Reformers discovered that the main thing was the main thing. Yes. When that was being lost in their day and age. And I think it's being mm -hmm. lost somewhat in our day oh, and oh, time. It's, it's, it's almost, I don't, I don't know if you would say it's as bad as Luther's time, but in some ways it is as mm -hmm. bad as Luther's time mm -hmm. because there's so much spiritual confusion. There's yes. moral confusion, I think. Yes. If you look at our society today, I think just within the last two, three years, I have sensed there is more moral confusion, mm -hmm. more questioning about what is a basic right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Where do we go to find what is right and wrong? What is the standard for right and wrong? Um, we have government uh, now working counterproductive mm -hmm. to the church on basic morality. We live in a time that in many ways is just as or more tumultuous as Luther's. Yeah, I agree. We need I a agree. new Reformation, right? I agree. Because With an evangelical. In the Catholic Church, they understood the Trinity. Yep. Well, of course, the Protestants understand the Trinity. And they the believe Trinity. the Trinity. And they believe the Trinity, exactly. The of Christ. Yeah. Virgin yeah, birth. Yeah, exactly. There's some aspects of agreement there. Now, in our day and age, oh. uh, people undercut the Trinity. They even undercut monotheism. Yeah. Uh, they're into polytheistic yeah. things. They're oh, yeah. into oh, yeah. New Age, Hinduism. Relativism. Yeah. So it all caves in yeah. from the understanding or a lack of yeah. understanding, a false understanding of who God is. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot in these uh, few topics, but uh, we're going to be covering some more interesting topics on our next segment of Christ and Culture. I think uh, I haven't talked to you about this, but uh, there are quite a few uh, top-notch Christian scholars that are caving in on basic Christian morality mm -hmm. and some popular speakers in our culture that are caving in on Christian morality. We want to talk about that. We want to try to try to answer them. Uh, they're making some pretty uh, uh, blatant attacks on Scripture, and we need to talk about that. But uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mel, for uh, sitting in uh, with me on this discussion. And uh, for all of you out there, happy Reformation Day. And we pray that this has been helpful to you in understanding the Reformation, and not only that, but more importantly, understanding our Christian faith. God bless. We'll see you back next week.